Hello and welcome to Agriculture Live. My name's Rebecca Shields. I'm from Agricultural Recruitment Specialists and today I'm being joined by Jack Potter from Wild Capital and we're going to be talking about biodiversity, net gain and nutrient neutrality. So a lot a lot to talk about there. Um, if you've got any questions or comments, please post them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. So let's go over to Jack. Welcome, Jack. Would you like to introduce yourself to us? Yeah, hi, Rebecca. And uh, yeah, my name's Jack Potter. Um, thanks for having me on this. Um, yeah, so yeah, my, I'm, I'm sort of a biodiversity uh, net gain and nutrient neutrality specialist. Um, been, been working in the industry, uh, I guess, most of my working life. Um, started off in government and uh, now I've uh, moved over to the dark side, as my former colleagues call it, um, in the private sector, sort of delivering it in practice. Um, but yeah, so I'm a, I'm a director and co-founder of a company called Wild Capital, and uh, we specialise in the developing uh, and originating offset schemes uh, in the nutrient neutrality and biodiversity net gain space. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's what we do. So when you were younger, did you always want to get into the biodiversity side or how did you come about this? So I think uh, I've always had a passion for ecology and I always sort of knew, I, well, I always thought I wanted to uh, go into the ecology space. I didn't know I was going to go into the offsetting offsetting industry um, or be involved in biodiversity net gain. But um, I mean, biodiversity is just another word for nature. So I guess I, I always wanted to be involved in nature. Um, but, you know, I grew up on a farm um, I'm from, a, from a, a, a long line of, uh, of farmers um, on my dad's side. Um, and, yeah, I guess growing up on a farm, being immersed in the environment, you know, every single day, um, even if it is doing a, a job, an agricultural job, like, you know, checking the sheep or whatever it is, um, or, you know, driving cattle from one side of the valley to the other through a woodland, you're always immersed in that nature. And I think that's what sparked the interest in me. Um, and I was sort of fortunate enough to have very supportive parents who sort of nurtured that and, and, and told me to you know, follow what I was most interested in. That's always good. So what um, makes Wild Capital, you know, stand out from their competitors, would you say? So I think there's a there's a there's a few points, really. Um, I mean, I guess from my background in this field, you know, I've worked in government. I, I, I guess helps define the policies and tools that we now see enshrined in legislation, um, both for nutrient neutrality and for, for biodiversity net gain. So I've got a very deep understanding of what, what the actual underlying drivers are for those markets um, and also helped establish the methodologies to, to calculate them and quantify them. So um, adding adding value to our customers uh, from day one, just from that, that very deep knowledge and expertise that we can offer to them. I think stands as apart from many of the other competitors who are maybe slightly more opportunistic um, uh, and maybe don't have that in-house specialty. So, so I guess that's one sort of um, uh, sort of USP that we have. Uh, one of the other things is that we, we've got institutional backer, so we've got sort of very deep pockets. There are there are sort of renewable energy uh, uh, sort of global uh, investment company. Um, we're very small fry for them, but effectively they have deeper pockets than this uh, entire market has to offer um so so we're very lucky it, 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 on that on that part um and i guess connected to that we we like to acquire the assets ourselves so i guess there's sort of two models at the moment in the in the in the offsetting industry one of them is to buy the land outright and one of them is to lease the land um and, and i guess this is how interactions with uh uh, the likes of wild capital and, and, and other offset providers has with the um, agricultural industry is whether it's a it's a sort of buyout for a very inflated value for one of these markets um, or it's a lease where you have an ongoing payment every year so we we do do both and we're very flexible which other organizations aren't um, but we do prefer to buy so we will we will buy land um, at inflated costs way above market value um, and the reason we do that is partly driven by me. Um, and the, one of the reasons I, I sort of co-founded Wild Capital, and that is um, that I don't want to see these, these measures temporarily. So one of, the, one, of the, one of the sort of quirks of the biodiversity metric is that you're only required to do the offset for 30 years. 
So it's a temporary mitigation. It's a very long time, but it's still temporary. And the developments that they're offsetting are actually for perpetuity. They're permanent, permanent impacts on, on our landscape. So part of the reason for establishing wild capital and having this institutional fund to be able to acquire the land itself is so that we can commit that these sites are going to be for nature forever rather than just for a 30 year period and um, you know passing it back to the landowner who can then do with it what they want who may well keep it like it is but they also may then plow it back up and put it back into agriculture mm. so that's that's one of the sort of usps that we're sort of standing apart from others and it is actually uh, seemingly being quite attractive to um, customers as well who who have very long-term visions and have maybe been operating for for, for very long time beyond you know 30 years ago that they were sort of established okay so it's great because you, you can tell that you've really got a passion for what you do um but some people might not know what biodiversity is so could you explain that yeah so i guess in, in its sort of purest sense um Biodiversity is just a fancy word for nature. Um, I'm not sure why we've gone down the route of calling it biodiversity rather than nature, because everyone's familiar with the word nature and less so about biodiversity. Um, I think there was a there was a, a, a sort of funny um, a BBC poll that they did with the public where they they asked people what they what biodiversity was, and I think most people thought it was some sort of detergent. So <laughs> I guess that just shows the sort of uh, the, the the level of um, misunderstanding of some of the terminology that we've chosen to use and actually there's a bit of an education piece here about making people understand that biodiversity you know it's not it's not a, a foreign thing that is for you know clever people or just ecologists or something it's it's something for everyone and um so so in terms of what is biodiversity itself what is nature itself it this i always consider it to be sort of three three different strands you've got diversity within species so that means like the genetic diversity the sort of um uh, i guess the resilience of that of that species by having a, a diverse gene, gene based gene pool um and, and there's, a, there's a an example that i remember from when i was doing my gcse's biology where there's a, a moth called the peppered moth which had two different color variations and there was a light form and a dark form and then the industrial revolution came along and every surface was blackened with soot and it meant that the dark form was really camouflaged and the light form really stood out and it meant that the light form ended up getting predated lots because it really mm. stood out against and that was just a, a sort of environmental change that that sort of impacted the population but because it was so diverse within its gene pool within that species it was able to survive so that's sort of one element and then the other element is what people traditionally consider to be nature or biodiversity and that is diversity of species so you know how many different types of birds are there or how many different types of mammals are there you know they're different mm. species and that's what people traditionally consider to be biodiversity and then the third one which i think is overlooked and should be integrated more into our thinking is the diversity between habitats mm. so um if you've got different habitats all next to each other they they sort of enable more species to be able to occupy that space because some of them might have part of their life cycle associated with one or sort of multiple habitats rather than just one in isolation so that's that's just a sort of overview of i guess how i see biodiversity and um yeah some of those are sort of formal definitions brilliant thanks jack so why is it so important um well there's, there's a number of reasons really i mean for me it's sort of intrinsic value but to quantify it there are sort of other you know um factors which are increasing in knowledge um, obviously, one of them that everyone knows about is food, um, you know, biodiversity, um, wildlife are, 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 are sort of required in many instances to, to pollinate crops, for example. Mm -hmm. um, if you lose them, we don't want to go and end up down the route of uh, some locations in China where they're hand pollinating fruit trees, for example, with brushes. Um, you know, they offer a service and, and that can actually be quantified in, in, in a monetary value. Um, that, that you know it's required for clean air you know all the impacts that we have on the environment biodiversity nature the environment they it can counteract that so it can buffer our impact on the environment and actually recover it so um having clean air is obviously really important especially in our in our built environment which is how sort of i guess it ties into biodiversity net gain um clean water as well biodiversity plays a crucial role in cleaning water um which is connected to, to um neutral neutrality um you know the health of our waterways and the ability to strip out nutrients and chemicals and things uh, through wetlands um 
And then there's also health and well-being. Um, you know, that's increasing in knowledge. You know, GPs are now prescribing people to actually uh, go and immerse themselves in nature or go and do some um, activities to, to um, like 5K, 5K walks or, or things like mm. that. Um, also medicine as well. You know, medicine is something that we don't know enough about nature. We don't know enough about all species to know what's going to be useful in the future. Um, mm. Just as an example, aspirin was was uh, discovered from from a plant called meadow sweet, which is a, a fairly uh, widespread plant in the in the UK. Um, and aspirin is obviously is is a very widespread widespread drug. So all of these things that they're, they're, they're very they're very useful, and sometimes we we don't know when they're going to be useful or even whether they're there or not. So yeah, so that's I guess that's my my overview. So what strategies have we got as a country? You know in relation to biodiversity and being, you know, being more aware of nature? So in terms of strategies, I think that, that there's a big movement at the moment for, uh, for, for biodiversity and for recovering our landscape. And, and that's through both the public sector and the private sector. And Obviously, through the through the um, the public sector, it's it's fairly well known. You know, there's government grant funding which gets allocated. Um, you know, I'm not going to comment on on uh, on the stewardship related schemes and uh, how effective they are, um, but they tend to add things to the to an already existing complex system um, rather than remove it. And whether they've been paying enough money for the right right solutions um, remains to be seen. I think. Um, but I think there's there's a place probably for for uh, a blend of private and public funds um, in different situations. Obviously, the public funds is, is very well known to farmers, um, and I think there's there's probably some way to go to improve that. Um, but the private side of it is, I guess, what I specialise in, which is these these nature markets, biodiversity, net gain, and nutrient neutrality are just two of those, and we're going to see a lot more in the future probably um, through. Uh, they call it um, uh, sort of voluntary biodiversity markets where effectively companies have to quantify their impacts on nature and then offset that to obviously reduce it first but then offset it and landowners and farmers are going to be crucial to um, being able to provide that solution to them so I guess there is a sort of there's a direction of travel whether there's a strategy or not I don't know probably not but I guess it's uh it's probably Public pressure and um, yeah, partly partly government government driven um, agendas, which is going to drive this. So, are there many job opportunities within this sector? Would you say? Well, it's absolutely massive. Yeah, I mean, I, I I never thought that when I started down this road when I left university that I I would be in a very high demand area. You know, as far as I was aware, it was there was more people applying for jobs than there were than there were jobs. So you ended up getting squeezed down and, you know, you'd end up basically not getting paid very much for, 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 for doing a, um, a job. And that didn't bother me because I was passionate about it. Um, and I actually selected the organisation I worked for based on who paid the poorest. That might, might sound really strange, but I wanted, to, I wanted to have more responsibility for the wage that I had. So I thought, well, people who are paying the worst are going to be giving more responsibility for that wage. And there'll also be less qualified people applying for those jobs. So I'm more likely to get it. So then, and that works. Clever way of thinking. Up, and I ended up scaling, scaling up through the, through the company fairly, fairly rapidly because, mm. because I was effectively overqualified and underpaid, which, which was mm. great if you want to succeed through that company. Um, but it was difficult to break in. And I think since then, it is completely turned on its head and the number of people that are moving from company to company being headhunted and all sorts is unreal you know people are moving around all the time just because there isn't enough expertise in this in this industry um because it's new it's nascent um and yeah there's not enough people coming through and i think that's potentially going to be an issue okay so what you know andrew's posted a comment there Andrew Goff he said you know you've done a great description it, it's nature is what biodiversity is but what career opportunities are there in the space for students still at school and maybe a year away from leaving school um, 
I mean, the, uh, my way in was through through the conservation charities uh, into this conservation space. That there are other routes. In fact, I'm I'm probably quite unusual in the way that I've ended up where I am now through that through that route. But conservation charities do offer um, apprenticeships and uh, um, internships. So I started on an internship. So I wasn't paid anything, but I had free accommodation. Um, and yeah, basically use some, some, some savings to, to, to fund, you know, feeding myself basically. Um, but it didn't take very long to get on the ladder on that organization, uh, just because you're already on the inside at that point and mm. you can get help from people who, you know, who already have jobs on the inside to help you, um, to, to get, to get the ladder basically onto, a, onto a paid role. So that was my way in. Um, but I know that there are, you know, a lot of other people who I work with um and people who are, i guess in a similar position to me they've gone through the going to um sort of i mean i did go to university but a lot of people have gone through the university to ecological consulting degrees so that they go straight into an ecological consulting job a lot of ecological consultants will do postgraduate um well they, they do graduate graduate positions and they'll hire seasonal staff um you know uh, for basically the summer, for the season, for, for the, the survey seasons, um, you can build up your uh, your experience and your um, licenses that you need for for species, for example. Or in my case, it was you know chainsaw ticket and uh, brush cutter mm -hmm. and you know um, that, 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 those sorts of things. So it, there's there's different ways into the market, um, and you could end up ending in the same place as someone else who came from a different route. But I guess. Yeah, the main the, the, the main thing is to to shine. I think um, to really yeah. throw yourself into it. I think if you if you sort of sit back and and don't pull your weight and really immerse yourself in it and show that you're committed and and you've got good work ethic, regardless mm -hmm. of what route you go into, um, then it's going to be tricky for you to scale and and, and break into um, mm -hmm. break into the industry. Are there many apprenticeships that are available? Do you know? Um, I, I'm not. I'm probably not that familiar with it. What's what's the, the situation today? Um, mm -hmm. It's not something I've looked into recently. At the time when I was applying, it was uh, there was a few internships. I think there may have been one or two apprenticeships as well. Um, but yeah, th th I think they are they are still around, and it's it is a really good way to get into it. And I guess the thing to think about is it is a short term thing, and probably the more you commit yourself to it, the shorter it will be. So, um, yeah, some people are put off by apprenticeships and internships because on its own, it doesn't look great, but mm. as a way to break into something, it's, it's probably one of the best routes. Yeah. And Jay has just said, when will biodiversity net gain become mandatory? Why is there a delay for mandatory biodiversity net gain for small sites until April 2024? Yeah, so mandatory biodiversity net gain um, as of February was that is, is now mandatory. So that's for major developments, but for small sites, it, there was a small delay. The reality is, larger sites probably hasn't even felt the impacts of mandatory biodiversity net gain because they spend so long in the planning system. So smaller sites, because they're smaller, they have smaller impacts and there's a risk that the, the the cost of the environmental benefit is actually similar to the cost of administrating that purchase of that environmental benefit. So you almost need a structure and a system set up to enable smaller sites to be able to just contribute easily at low cost to an existing scheme. Mm -hmm. And when mandatory biodiversity net gain was announced in February, that's that's when everyone started moving almost and and it wasn't that that system wasn't set up now obviously we're in april and small sites are now live in, in terms of them being mandatory as well now um and we're still not at that stage so i suspect that when small sites go through the quick system quicker and maybe two or three months time there's going to be maybe a lot of people screaming about the fact that there's no solution for them to be able to just contribute easily into okay so can you tell us what net gain is because there will be people that don't know. Yeah, so I mean, biodiversity net gain is 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 simply just balance, balancing the books of nature from an impact of a development site um, and adding a bit more into it. So 
you've got a, a development site that may well be impacting some you know species poor grassland for example um or an arable field or something on the edge of a town and they're building some sheds or they're building some houses and that nature gets quantified through the biodiversity metric so that's what i was working in natural england and in sort of government team helping to build and define the policies for and it's it quantifies nature effectively and so an arable field will have a have a value in biodiversity units and then the impact of that from the development so the development will be able to map out so we're going to destroy everything for example and we're going to put some sheds here and some houses here and we're going to have a bit of green space over here with some um some uh, drainage features and whatever and then they can start saying okay well on the development site we've actually got the drainage feature which has biodiversity value we can quantify that in the metric mm. and we're going to have some uh, a rain garden or you know some open green space or some road verges and they've all got quantifiable biodiversity values that can get put into the metric and then effectively the metric will balance balance those books for you and say okay well is it is it a net gain or is it a net loss or is it net neutral mm. and if there's a net loss or it's net neutral and there's a requirement to go above and beyond then you need to offset so that's where the offsetting and that's where well capital that's where we where we come in um offering to sell those those uh those requirements the shortfalls in the metric from the development um to the developer to to offer them a service to to balance their books for nature okay and so why what, sorry i just wanted to ask about nutrient neutrality how would you define that so nutrient neutrality is much simpler in concept, but much more tricky in terms of the solutions. So it's just a couple of chemicals basically that are impacting our waterways. It's nitrogen and phosphorus, um, and there's different catchments which are impacted by different chemicals. It was all driven by some uh, European legislation, which was then enshrined in British legislation and a piece of case law, which effectively said if our if our designated sites or our sort of jewels in the crown of our environment are not meeting their conservation objectives, if they're failing as a result of nutrients, then you can't add any more to it. You can't give a permission which adds any more to it because you're just making the situation worse. Mm. So in, in, in the case of the, the, the sites of the UK, we have a sort of saltwater systems, so harbours at the end of river systems that meet the sea. And generally they're limited by nitrogen so that so nitrogen will be the limiting factor to the environmental response which is impacting those sites and that's mm -hmm. generally macroalgae so you get these algal mats which form and that's directly as a result of two high levels of nitrogen and that algal mat will smother salt marshes it will smother the mud flats and birds won't be able to to be able to get to the mud and it will change the chemistry of the mud so it starts really degrading those sites and where you've got permissions being being granted, for example, um, for a new housing development, um, then that would be more water going to the sewer network. And the sewer network doesn't treat it to 100% efficiency. There's always a residual amount that comes out of the pipe. And that will mean there's more nutrients going into the, into the system. So the legislation basically says you can't add any more. So that permission can't be granted then unless you prove that you're removing something from the system. So that's how neutrality plays into this. So nutrient neutrality, mm. you're, it's a one in one out system. It's very similar to the likes of carbon offsetting, but it's much more ge geographically constrained. So mm. it needs to be where the impact is happening, the uh, the offset, the, the sort of one in one out process needs to be happening within the same catchment. So what does it have River systems. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Rebecca, you also have river systems which are more impacted by phosphorus. And geographically, that's much more tricky because you need to where the impact is on that river system you also need to offset with the, sort of from that point or above so and this is all this is all i guess a sticking plaster um temporarily until the designated sites get restored which is the mm. ultimate goal and that's the responsibility the government need to take on so what does all of this mean for the future what's the impact well i guess nutrient neutrality I think everyone would probably hope that it, it is a temporary uh, a temporary requirement um i think it's it's probably a little bit of a bonfire under the asses of the uh, of the government um to get to get them to to sort of spring into action 
they tried to get rid of nutrient neutrality and sort of cut it out of legislation. Um, but the reality is it's here to stay. I think it's been very difficult and probably quite quite dangerous for the environment for them to unpick nutrient neutrality now. So I think they're left with the only option of um, restoring the designated sites and trying to make the nutrient neutrality market work. So that's, I guess, a probably short to medium term uh, offset market, which is probably going to be here. And yeah, I guess the, the time scale probably depends on your um, your faith in the government's uh, delivery. Uh, biodiversity net gain is a, is a very different story. It's more of a positive news story rather than a negative. This is a, a sort of direction of travel. You know, historically, it's always been only concentrating on protected species, you know, impacts of developments on protected species. But now we're moving much more to a holistic environment position. Um, it may well even go further than that in the future and, and sort of go into you know, access to nature for people and things for those development sites. And there's, there's a very exciting space, which is sort of gaining momentum. And I think this is just the first industry. So the development industry is a very obvious one that sort of has a one point in time where it destroys the environment. And you can then go and do something to make that right and then secure it. So it's a very easy one to sort of trial this on. I think what's really exciting for me is is how how this is going to cascade into other companies, into the more voluntary market, voluntary biodiversity markets, and that is just going to ramp up. Um, and and I think it's it will be a it will be a global market, um, and it's and it's only just started. So I think it's a really big opportunity in the future. So there will be lots of job opportunities available within this industry, won't there? Yeah, it's going to be expanding massively. So a question I wanted to know, Jack, is how do we relate in relation to other countries for our biodiversity schemes and so on? So biodiversity net gain was actually brought across from Australia. So I think Australia effectively coined the idea of quantifying using a metric nature and, and using it to be able to quantify whether something is having a benefit or a negative. Mm. So we're not, definitely not the first. But I do think that we're probably the most advanced in terms of government legislating it um, and, and making it mandatory. I don't think it'll be too long before others follow. I know Germany are making movements towards this sort of approach. Um, Scotland have just got a consultation out at the moment about, because uh, biodiversity net gain only relates to England at the moment. Mm -hmm. But I think Scotland are looking to, to um, modify our, the, the, the English metrics for, that, for Scottish purposes. Um, so that we'll be going down a similar approach. But I think the development industry is probably one that's easy for people to 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 almost um, dip their toe in the water of of, of biodiversity net gain. Um, and I think it's, it's it's a good one to ease into the the voluntary market. And do you think the government does take this seriously enough? Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, I think for well for biodiversity net gain, I think they. They certainly do and it's been a long time coming you know this this is 10 years in the making so the industry has had plenty of time to respond to this to understand it um local authorities probably haven't had enough detail soon enough to be able to respond to it in enough time to to, mm. to um make it work for developments in the short term mm. um but it's but it's been eased into it there's been a lot of consultation processes and it's been evolved which is which is what's needed to to, to bring something new to a market and I think the way that they've structured it is perfect for a private market. So it's all designed to encourage private investment into this industry rather than it being subsidized by government. Um, so there's statutory credits, which the government provide, which effectively sort of, if you're stuck and you can't find an offset, then you can go to the statutory credits, but they purposely sort of made them very, very expensive, which effectively means that it's not being it's not undercutting the private market so it encourages mm -hmm. private market to come forwards and actually offer these solutions up neutral neutrality on the other hand i think i think to date everyone's been hoping it would go away um and there's been a lot of mumblings and nothing certain from government which all it's done is created a lot of uncertainty in the market and that's created a lot of nervousness so it's a very it's currently considered as a very volatile market and the government have just pumped in lots of money to each individual uh, catchment, which is affected. And the remit is sort of spend it on nutrient mitigation. And some local authorities are proposing to do their own mitigation. And they're probably going to be charging that at cost. 
So again, that creates huge uncertainties for that market. And um, you know, if you're progressing a nutrient scheme, for example, which might take nine, 12 months to, to bring forwards and cost hundreds of thousands of pounds, um, and then the local authority are progressing on in the background and they flood the market with credits at cost, suddenly your scheme's not viable and you spent lots of money at risk. So I think then there needs to be a lot more direction from government currently um, and also transparency over different types of schemes before that mm. sort of joins the level of biodiversity net gain in terms of the, the, the planning process. So what can the agricultural and farming industry do to be more nature focused, would you say? Um, I guess it, I guess uh, I mean, the one which is which is widespread is obviously the, the government funding side of things. Um, there's lots of cluster farms which are which are popping up all over the place now. Um, I know our own family farm was part of a, a, a cluster farm for many years. Um, to understand, I guess, holistically across a landscape, what, what is actually best for your landscape and having some advice from an expert ecologist, you know, what's important on your farm and, you know, what it's special for, because something might be common to you, but actually in the, in the context of the UK, um, it might be very rare and it might be very special. So understanding those sorts of things and, and what you're interested in pursuing and progressing, and then, you know, the likes of um, the government grant system um, is 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 ideal. It's very bureaucratic, but it's but it is ideal to fund that sort of approach. Um, yeah, and and there's I guess there's the voluntary market to keep an eye on. Biodiversity net gain. Um, you know, there's obviously the selling of selling of parcels of land which are maybe you know poor pieces of land agriculturally. They might lie wet, um, and they might not you know, particularly yield high for agriculture, but for biodiversity, it might be absolutely perfect. In fact, it quite often mm. is the case that, that that is the case. Um, but, and there's also the lease, the lease side of things. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's getting, getting advice on, on what you've got is probably the, probably the first step and cluster, cluster farms and, and ecologists are, I guess, the, um, probably the best route for that. And there's been a big push with tree planting and things like that, hasn't there? Yeah, but people love trees. You can you can name them and say, oh, million trees, and people can hear a number in their head and think that's great. Um, but yeah, so it's the right trees in the right place, as people say. Um, and yeah, there's government funding to plant trees. I think uh, I mean I'm, this isn't my area of expertise, but I know in the sort of there's a there's a, there's a sort of carbon um, carbon market opportunity with a, a blend of sort of public and private finance, where the government will pay to plant the trees and um, private finance through carbon offsetting would effectively uh, create the yield which is required to make it work for a farm. So mm. yeah, there's various opportunities like that. Um, and there are also companies that are saying, you know, for every, you know, I, I spoke to one a year ago or so who said for every piece of equipment they sell, you know, they sell tally handlers and uh, for every tally handler they sell, they'll plant a tree. Um, mm. And they accumulated a pot of money and came to me and said, right, we need to plant some trees. Where do we plant them? And this is how much we've got. So, yeah, there's, there are some probably niche opportunities like that, which might be useful. So there's going to be lots of new opportunities for in terms of recruitment in this market and in terms of new entrants into the sector. Um, what would you say in terms of attracting people into this area? How could we do more of that? Um. I mean, I think it's it, work experience, I think would, a lot of people who work in this industry are genuinely really passionate about it. Mm. And I think I personally feel like just exposing yourself to someone who is really passionate about something is actually enough to spark an uh, enthusiasm in it. So mm. I think shadowing people, having work experience, maybe when you're at school or maybe looking at internships, apprenticeships type thing to, 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 to be exposed to those sorts of people. Um, I think is a is a good way to to spark an interest, um, but yeah, maybe maybe at the education side as well, there, there could be more to be done. I know when I was at school and also at university, there's there's probably a lot to be desired in terms of um, opening doors and making you aware of these opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. I certainly didn't know that this was something that was coming down the road and 
could be an opportunity to go into and and uh, and specialize in um so there's probably a few things yeah definitely and i think things move so fast that jobs that when we were at school weren't even um weren't even there that you know that are now um for us to even consider yeah no 100 percent. same with me i d didn't think i'd be doing this when i was at university or at school yeah um yeah i think for me i've never i never really went into this industry thinking that it was going to be you know there's going to be lots of jobs available and it's going to be um you know really lucrative or anything i i went into this industry because i'm genuinely passionate about it um mm. it, is, it is my life passion and and i would have done it whatever happened it's just completely by chance that um there are you know there's quite a high demand for jobs at the moment but i think even if there wasn't I'd still be really happy and I think that's really important to do something that you are genuinely genuinely interested in so mm. yeah I, I wouldn't yeah I wouldn't necessarily encourage people solely to go down this route you know purely because there's a job a job available um but most people do like nature when they get when they get to know it though and I think it's a difficult thing for people not to be uh inspired by it when especially when you're surrounded by people who are passionate about it and I think like the young people now are a lot more environmentally aware than say 20 years ago. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely going up the public agenda. I think there probably is quite a bit to do in terms of educating what's important because I think sometimes headlines and things that can get people's attention aren't always the sort of best direction sometimes there are you know things that are crying out that that need attention that mm. don't get that that public um uh sort of airing which mm. need it definitely well thanks jack i've really enjoyed talking to you today um we've had some good questions which we've covered um it's given me a lot to think about i'm sure the viewers listeners will have a lot to think about too um thank you everybody for watching and joining us today and thank you jack um if you've got an interesting topic in agriculture or farming or related that you would like to talk about please contact me via agricultural recruitment specialists which is www.agrirs.com um, and all that's left to say is thanks again would you like to say goodbye jack yeah, no, thanks for having me, Rebecca. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.